Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Cummings from Point Loma Nazarene University. This is part three of a three-part video series on antibiotic resistance. Now, to understand antibiotic resistance, you really do need to remember the mechanisms of action, the targets of the different classes of antibiotics. And then we talked about the first four of the five most common resistance strategies. Eflux pumps that take the antibiotic and pump it out. <clears throat> drug modification enzymes that add some functional group to the drug uh, so that the drug no longer works. Target protection factors are proteins that bind to whatever the antibiotic target is, blocking the antibiotic from binding to it. And then target replacement factors where uh, whatever the target is, in the case of sulfa drugs, for example, there are a couple key enzymes that the sulfa drugs go after. The most common resistance mechanism for those would be to provide a new um, a replacement essentially for that enzyme that is non-susceptible to the antibiotic. Now the fifth very common strategy and arguably the most uh, most common of all these strategies are drug destruction enzymes and we're going to sp specifically talk about <clears throat> enzymes that break apart the beta-lactam antibiotics and if you remember the beta-lactams are the penicillins, the cephalosporins, and the carbapenems. Carbapem, okay, penem, there we go. I can't talk and write at the same time. <clears throat> now we're gonna talk about different types of beta-lactamases and the way those different classes or, or uh, categories of beta-lactamases impact these three different classes of beta-lactam drugs. <clears throat> and then we're gonna talk about beta-lactamase inhibitors. So as part of our battle against the bacteria, when we suspect a beta-lactamase resistance enzyme, we have some inhibitors we can add in some cases that'll knock out the resistance, therefore allowing the antibiotic to continue to work. So if you remember, we talked about the first four, efflux, modification, target protection, target replacement, and the fifth one is breaking apart the antibiotic with an enzyme. That's what's going on right here. Now, if you remember, the target of the beta-lactam drugs is the peptidoglycan. And so these, these beta-lactam aces the, that break apart the beta-lactam drugs are often going to be found associated with the peptidoglycan. If it's a gram positive, it might be affiliated with a thick peptidoglycan wall. If it's a gram negative, it's almost always going to be found inside the periplasm between the two membranes where the peptidoglycan is found. So let's jump into beta-lactamases. <clears throat> These are bacterial enzymes that cleave the, um, the bond between the carbonyl carbon and the amino nitrogen within the ring of penicillin-type antibiotics. So the first beta-lactamases to show up were specifically penicillinases. They were essentially what you might call a narrow-spectrum beta-lactamase in that it was only the penicillin-type drugs that they were effective against. And this is a, a hydrolysis reaction like any other, so we're going to add an OH on one side to make a carboxyl group. We're going to add an H to our nitrogen to make a true amino group and break apart that bond. This penicillo penicilloic acid is not effective against the... Um, uh, <clears throat> against the bacteria, and so the bacteria can protect themselves with a simple penicillinase. So when you hear the word penicillinase, recognize that this is a type of beta-lactamase, a type of beta-lactamase that's most effective against the penicillin class of beta-lactam drugs. Now, there are three major groups, if you will, of beta-lactamases based on which antibiotics they're good against. Uh, so the penicillinases penicillin aces break apart the penicillin class only. These are narrow spectrum beta-lactamases. They don't touch the cephalosporins or the carbapenems. These are extremely common. Uh, it's estimated that about 80% of all Staphylococcus aureus uh, bacteria that cause infections in the United States are carrying a penicillinase, meaning that if we suspect a Staph aureus uh, as the cause of a particular infection, we're not likely to, to prescribe a penicillin because most of them appear to be carrying these penicillinase beta-lactamases. <clears throat> very, very common. The next is what we call the extended spectrum beta-lactamases, very, very commonly called ESBLs. This acronym is worth learning because it comes up a lot in the clinic. These ESBLs are really cephalosporinases. <clears throat> 
And the cephalosporinases, it turns out, are useful against both the cephalosporins and the penicillins. So when bacteria show up with one of these ESBLs, we've lost all of our cephalosporins and all of our penicillins with very few exceptions. Um, the, I said that we had an 80% rate of these penicillinases in Staph aureus as an example. They're found in a variety of other species. The ESBLs aren't at that high rate yet, but they are taking off. We're seeing them heading into sort of an exponential spread across the globe, and they're showing up everywhere. Now, the one group, the third group that is the broadest spectrum, if you will, are, are the carbapenem aces. And the carbapenem aces are going to be able to break apart the carbapenems, the cephalosporins, and the penicillins. You can tell these are going to be the most dangerous, right? One single gene coding for one single enzyme, can knock out all three classes of beta-lactam antibiotics. And if you remember, we said in one of the earlier videos that the beta-lactam antibiotics represent about half, maybe even more than half, of all the antibiotics that we prescribe around the world. <clears throat> so a single gene acquired through horizontal gene transfer can knock out half of our options, in some cases more than half of our options and we find ourselves in a pretty dangerous place. Ideally, we'd use penicillinases, and sometimes we still, or we'd use penicillins, pardon me, and sometimes we still do use straight penicillins, especially when we don't suspect uh, a penicillinase beta-lactamase. Um, other times we jump ahead to cephalosporins when we don't suspect an ESBL, um, but we're worried about a penicillinase. And the only time we go to carbapenemases is if we have to, because they're uh, hard on the patient's body and they have to be delivered through injection or IV. And so it's not something you can give them a, a little bottle of and send them home and expect your patient to, to be able to comply with taking them appropriately. So <clears throat> we, we avoid the carbapenems if we can help it. Fortunately, the carbapenemases are still very, very uncommon. We've seen a handful of them cropping up little outbreak here, little outbreak there, but they're not all that common yet. Let me remind you, in case you've sort of lost the forest for the trees, we're talking about happy little bacteria with their chromosome, which has all their main DNA that keeps them alive, their housekeeping genes. And we're talking about genes for acquired resistance that are found on plasmids. And so one of these ARGs, antibiotic resistance genes, could code for any one of these three types of beta-lactamases. And in fact, some plasmids will have multiple different beta-lactamases all encoded on the same plasmid. And then don't forget how a gene works, right? If, if this is the gene for the beta-lactamase on our plasmid, and the DNA continues in both directions to complete the circle, <clears throat> this has to be expressed through transcription, TXN we'll use for transcription, and translation to produce a protein. So you've got a beta-lactamase gene that's double-stranded DNA, but through expression forms the beta-lactamase protein. It's the protein that acts as the enzyme that chews up our penicillins, our cephalosporins, or our carbapenems. So it's important to understand there are different types of beta-lactamases out there, and I want you to recognize uh, what the, the main differences are uh, in the three main classes. Now, it turn, let's go back. The narrow-spectrum beta-lactamases um, and the ESBLs and the carbapenems, um, the carbapenemases, can all be inhibited to varying degrees by beta-lactamase inhibitors. So if you look at this clavulanic acid or potassium clavulinate, that A-T-E and ic acid mean the same thing in uh, organic chemistry. So clavulinate or clavulanic acid <clears throat> is a natural microbial compound. And the reason it acts as an inhibitor of beta-lactamases is because it actually has its own beta-lactam ring. You see that? That looks just like the beta-lactam rings of our drugs. And so if we put some of this in with one of our penicillins, for example, like amoxicillin, the enzyme will be busy wrestling with this clavulanic acid, thinking this is what it needs to destroy because it's analogous to, very, very similar structurally to its natural um, substrate. And so the amoxicillin is left alone and is allowed to, to go forward and, uh, and actually kill the bacteria. When we combine amoxicillin with clavulinate, we have augmentin. Most of you have heard of augmentin. There are really three uh, common beta-lactamase inhibitors that we see. So clavulanic acid <clears throat> can either be combined with amoxicillin or um, another drug called ticercillin. 
sulbactam is commonly uh, combined with ampicillin, and tazobactam is commonly combined with piperacillin. <clears throat> if you remember in lab, this guy right here, piperacillin with tazobactam, was one of the antibiotics you tested in your Kirby Bauer disc diffusion test. Now, the last thing I'm going to leave you with when it comes to uh, resistance and beta-lactamase inhibitors, right? If you think about it, okay, bacteria rise and cause infections. And so we, in response, discover these compounds called penicillins, <clears throat> and we attack the bacteria with them. In response, the bacteria uh, adapt with these beta-lactamases to protect them. And so at our end, in response, we come up with beta-lactamase inhibitors to knock out their beta-lactamases. And it turns out that, and it shouldn't surprise you, we're starting to see bacteria showing up with beta-lactamases that are resistant to our inhibitors. The inhibitors do not inhibit some of these. Um, and many of the, if I go back to here, many of these narrow-spectrum beta-lactamases up here are now inhibitor-resistant forms. Many of the ESBLs still remain sensitive, and I think it's unknown with the carbapenemases because we've done so very little with them. All right, lots to think about with this last category of um, antibiotic resistance, these, these uh, drug destruction enzymes, and in particular, this example of the beta-lactamases that we gave. So let's summarize what we just talked about because there was a lot going on there. <clears throat> the most common mechanism of resistance to the beta-lactam antibiotics are beta-lactam aces. So these are enzymes that the bacteria can produce, usually due to a gene that's on a plasma that they've acquired. And that enzyme breaks apart the beta-lactam antibiotic, the penicillin, the cephalosporin, or in some cases, the carbapenem. Different beta-lactamases have different properties, right? We've got the narrow-spectrum penicillinases. We've got the cephalosporinases that are extended-spectrum beta-lactamases, or ESBLs. And then we have the carbapenemases that have the broadest spectrum, and they'll destroy anything with a beta-lactam ring, carbapenem, cephalosporins, and penicillins. And then finally, we have beta-lactamase inhibitors that can often overcome um, some of the resistance that we see to, to beta-lactam antibiotics. But as a footnote, we're also seeing these inhibitor-resistant beta-lactamases that are beginning to arise and taking away at least some of the power of our inhibitors. That was a lot. That short little video lecture there just contained a ton of information. Uh, take notes, go back. This is one you're going to want to watch multiple times, I think, to really nail it down and let me know what questions you have. Good luck with this, guys.